I don't think there's ever been more young talent in the NBA than the current day. So in today's video, we're going to be looking at every NBA team's best young player. So they got to be 25 years old or younger. And we're going to talk about, can we really build around them for the future? Or they're more of a complimentary piece to maybe a later guy that they have to build around. So if you guys enjoy the videos, feel free to drop a thumbs up and let's get into it. So the first player we are talking about is Jason Tatum of the Boston Celtics. He is 25 years old. I know he's no longer 19, right? But yeah, Tatum is the guy you want to build around in this case, a 25 year old, 6'8", two way wing. That's a three level score at the next level. He averaged 30 points per game in 2023. He shoots 35 plus points percent from three on a very high clip so since Tatum entered the NBA the Celtics have made it to five Eastern Conference Finals including one NBA Finals back in 2022 Next offseason, Tatum will be in line for the Supermax, and he's going to be getting it from the Celtics on day one. Next up, we have the Brooklyn Nets, and their best young player is Nick Claxton. So Nick Claxton broke out last season, especially on the defensive end. He's 24 years old. He averaged around 12 and a half points last season. He led the NBA in field goal percentage, just above 70%. He's a really good shot blocker. He's a great rim protector. He's that floor general center that you want to build around in the future. The Nets will have a big decision to make next offseason when he could be a free agent do you want to pay big time money to a center that can't space the floor but then if they can get Claxton on a good bargain or if he takes another step this year especially on the offensive end it could be justified staying in New York we have the New York Knicks now and their best young player is RJ Barrett who's 23 years old RJ has just so much discourse around the NBA community I feel like some people think that he's still going to take that next step and could be somebody that the Knicks could build around and then other people just think that he's just a glorified shot chucker. RJ's efficiency has definitely been kind of his main problem over the last two seasons. He broke out in 2021 shooting 40% from three and 44% from the field, but both those field goal percentages dropped the following year. And while he did get his field goal percentage back up to 43% last season, his three-point percentage dropped. So in a two-year span, his three-point percentage dropped from 40% to 31%. So yeah, that's just not what you want to see from somebody going from his age 20 to 22 seasons. His peak was always like that DeMar DeRozan type player. So I don't think RJ Barrett is really somebody you're trying to build your franchise around, but can maybe be that number two option at the absolute best, or possibly a number four option at the worst. Tyrese Maxey is going to be the Sixers player we're going to mention here. And if it was up to Daryl Morey, he wouldn't be traded for anybody in the NBA. I don't think for Luka. I don't think for Giannis. I don't think for Jokic. Morey loves Maxey. And I mean, how can you not? Maxey was a late first round pick back in 2020 and he's improved each and every year of his three-year career averaging eight points as a rookie didn't really play a lot only 15 minutes a night and then he got way more volume and a such higher usage the following year where he averaged 17 and a half points he shot 48 percent from the field played in 75 games and started 74 of them and then last year for the Sixers he did deal with an injury but he averaged 20 points he shot 43 percent from three on six attempts a night 48 percent from the field I think the only gripe with Max is if you want to decide is he a point guard is he a shooting guard he's maybe not as good of a playmaker to be your lead ball handler but at 6-2 is he a little bit smaller to be your shooting guard or at least guarding shooting guards on the defensive side of the ball the area of probably where he needs to work on the most of his game. But yeah, I think Maxi is somebody you could definitely build around. And if the Sixers ever go into a full-on rebuild, he's the guy they're keeping around. Heading up to Canada here, we have Scotty Barnes, the 2022 Rookie of the Year for the Toronto Raptors. Man, I feel like also Scotty Barnes has so much discourse in a way like fans think you can really build around him to be your guy, or he's really never going to develop those skills on the offensive end, at least in the scoring department. Because Barnes has not been an efficient jump shooter in the NBA. He shot 30% from three in his rookie year and then 28% from three last year also shot only 45% from the field but what's encouraging is his ability to get better at the foul line he got to the foul line a little bit more in year two and while he did average the same amount of points in year one to year two his assist went up and that's what I think I'm excited the most about Scotty Barnes if the Raptors experiment with him as the lead ball handler as a potential point guard in 2024 and that's where we can decide where Scotty Barnes can be your franchise player man the Chicago Bulls they need a little bit more young talent. So their guy is Patrick Williams, who they took fourth overall back in 2020. And I'm just waiting for the Patrick Williams breakout year because we haven't gotten it yet. And a lot of people thought it was going to happen in 2022, but then he only ended up playing in 17 games. So people thought it was going to be in 2023, but yeah, it did not happen. Now, Patrick Williams is a plus defender. Don't get me wrong, but I would like to see him keep developing on the offensive end. He averaged 10 points and four rebounds last year with 1.2 assists a night, but he's a very good free throw shooter for somebody at his size. He only 
only took eight shots a night last year. And with DeMar DeRozan, Levine, and Vucevic coming back, I don't really expect that number to jump up too much in year four, which is a shame. So this is really a make or break year for Patrick Williams and the Chicago Bulls. There were some sketchy rumors this offseason with Darius Garland and how the Cavs may look to move him, which I think is just so dumb because Garland is one of the best young point guards in the NBA. And Garland has really come a long way. After watching him in his rookie season to what he is now, I've just seen so much development. Back in 2020, when he was a rookie, he was struggling so much at being efficient around the rim. And he's just gotten so much better in every type of way of his scoring. He shot 41% from three last season on six attempts a night. He shot 46% from the field on 16 attempts a night. He averaged 21 points and eight assists. He's 23 years old right now. And like I said before, he's one of the best young point guards in the NBA and the Cavs have a gem here. For some reason, Cade Cunningham is like talked about as winning most improved player next year, which I think is a little bit silly because he was the number one overall pick. So he's supposed to improve and play well. But I'm just so excited to see Cade back after only seeing him play 12 games this past season. Because what Cade can do on the offensive end is just so special to watch as a playmaker, as a scorer inside. The one thing I hope he develops this season is a little bit more of a jump shot because he did shoot 31% from three in his rookie year. And in a very small sample size, he shot 27% from three in year two. But he's a good free throw shooter so I think it's going to translate to behind the arc and there's a possibility we see 2023 Darius Garland type numbers out of Cade Cunningham in 2024. Yo shout out to Tyrese Halberton man getting the rookie max extension which nowadays is just an insane amount of money where you could be making 50 million dollars at the end of it but it's very deserved to Halliburton. Halliburton is one of the players that I could say I was right about in my pre-draft evaluation process. I absolutely loved him out of Iowa State. I thought it was absolutely criminal for him to fall outside the top five let alone the top 10. I still can't believe some of those teams in the back end of the top 10 passed up on him, including my Knicks. Halburn's a do-it-all point guard. He's efficient. He's a good passer. He's a good rebounder. He's good in transition. He's a good defender. He's a good overall scorer. He's just everything you want in a franchise point guard. Yeah, so if we're talking about the Bucks' young core, it's not very deep. So Marjan Beauchamp is the young player here we're going to talk about for the Milwaukee Bucks. He's 22 years old, and the Bucks don't even have many future first-round picks. So he may be this guy for the next three years if he's still a buck. But yeah, I think Beauchamp can develop into being a solid shooter for Milwaukee going forward. He shot 33% from downtown in his rookie season. I actually like his form a decent amount too. And if he could play a little bit off ball this year and improve in just kind of his half court sets, he could be a good role player in the future for Milwaukee. But I don't think he's going to be anything above that. I mean, we've talked a lot of discourse in this video about guys like RJ Barrett and Scotty Barnes. But yeah, Trey Young is so divided in which NBA fans either love or hate. Because Trey Young is one of the best offensive players. Not even just offensive it's a point guards, offensive players in the NBA. You can make an argument he's the best passing point guard in the NBA. And while his three-point percentage did drop from 38% in 2022 to 33% in 2023, he's still one of the league's best and most lethal three-point shooters. The big knock on Trey Young is, can you build around him as your number one option if he's a liability on the defensive end? But we've seen plenty of bad defenders be franchise's top guy over the last couple of years. And I think playing another year next to DeJounte Murray, who's a good defender, can really help Trey Young in that department. So yeah, I'm on the Trey Young can be your franchise player side. Like Halliburton, LaMelo Ball got the rookie max extension as well. He was really good in a small sample size in 2023, played only 36 games, but averaged 23 points, eight and a half assists, and six and a half rebounds. While the field goal percentage isn't where you want it to be at a career 42% shooter, he's a career 37% three-point shooter and was absolutely not knocked down from three last year, shooting 37% on 10 attempts a night. He's also a really good free throw shooter when he can get to the line. And he's one of the league's best rebounders at the point guard position due to his 6'7 frame. So yeah, I'm excited to see LaMelo Ball play with Brandon Miller and others in Charlotte this year. It was so funny on draft night in 2022 because nobody had any idea what Orlando was going to do. Were they going to take Jabari Smith? Were they going to take Chet Holmgren? They did neither of those two and they ended up drafting Paolo Bancaro and boy, oh boy, was it the best decision they could ever make. Paolo was fantastic on the offensive end in his rookie season for somebody that you want when he was 19 years old, averaging 20 points, seven rebounds, just under four assists a night from a power forward. He shot 42% from the field and 29% from three 
in a vacuum, that's not terrible for a 19-year-old. And you could saw him get better and better as the season went along. He was so close to being the unanimous rookie of the year, and the Magic have a special one to build around there in Orlando. For the Wizards, it could be a couple guys, but I'm going to go with Jordan Poole, the main piece that they got in the Chris Paul trade. Poole's still only 24 years old. He was a first-round pick back in 2019. We're probably going to see him average another career high in points because that's been the story of his career, a career high in 2021, 2022, and 2023. And as the number one option, and probably a non-playoff Wizards team, he's going to average a career high, in my opinion, in 2024. I have such a love-hate relationship with Michael Porter Jr. I just feel like it's sometimes he could be one of the league's best spot-up shooters, and he's like a top 30 guy I would want on my team because of how elite he is in the catch-and-shoot and just behind the arc, shooting 41% from three last year at his 6'10 size. But his just lack of playmaking ability and ball vision and basketball IQ can really hurt his value sometimes. But in Denver, he's just absolutely perfect. He's not the lead point guard because that's Jamal Murray. He's not the franchise's best player because that's Nikola Jokic. So he's the third option. He knows his role and that's what he's good at. I don't know if anybody else on this list took a bigger jump next year just to NBA superstardom than Shea Gildas Alexander. Shea's numbers last year were just absolutely ridiculous. 31 points per game, five and a half assists, 4.8 rebounds, 1.6 steals, and oh yeah, he shot 51% from the field on 20 attempts a night. He shot 34% from three on about two and a half attempts a night. And yeah, he shot 90% from the line on 11 attempts a night. Shea was one of the league's not just best offensive players, just overall players last season. And he turns 25 in two days. So happy early birthday to Shea. All right, we got our first rookie on the list. And for Portland, it's going to be Scoot Henderson. I decided to choose him over Anthony Simons or Shaden Sharp because I think he has the highest potential out of the three. And I'm so happy that Portland is going to be trading Damian Lillard because it just makes so much more sense to really go on a full-on rebuild, build around those three young players I mentioned, especially Scoot Henderson to be your lead franchise point guard. I think Scoot Henderson's jump shot is going to be fine. He's being trained and mentored by Steph Curry, so there's nobody else you'd rather be mentored by. And I'm just so excited to watch him just run the show in Portland once they trade Dame. The Jazz have an interesting one. It's Walker Kessler, who's 21 years old. He surprised so many people last year as a rookie. He was drafted 22nd overall by the Minnesota Timberwolves, and then the Timberwolves shipped him off in the Rudy Gobert trade. And it's crazy because you could have made an argument that you would rather have had Walker Kessler last year than Rudy Gobert already. He averaged 2.3 blocks per game as a rookie, shot 72% from the field. He knows his role. And I would just love to hear your guys' opinions in the comments. Who do you think's better long-term, Nick Claxton or Walker Kessler? Man, just a few years ago, this Warriors young core just looked like it could be one of the best in the league with James Wiseman, a second overall pick, Moses Moody, a lottery pick, and the player we're going to talk about here, Jonathan Kuminga. Now, you could make an argument it could be Brendan Pozemski as well, who's looked fantastic in the summer league, but I still think Kuminga, who's only 20 years old, yeah, he's going to be just turning 21 to start the season in year three, so he's still incredibly young. And I think, yeah, he has the potential to be that guy in Golden state will he ever be a number one option on a championship team probably not but he has all the athleticism in the world and with Draymond coming back in Golden State maybe we're never going to see him shine in this current role he has right now being behind Draymond so maybe we need to wait to see Kuminga get traded to ever see his full potential kind of like Patrick Williams the Clippers young core is also pretty rough so we're going to be talking about Bones Highland man Bones really had a fall off last season because he looked fantastic as a rookie for Denver coming off the bench in the absence of Jamal Murray who was hurt in his rookie year he was the 26th overall pick and then got traded for a second round pick at last year's trade deadline. So that was a head scratcher, especially for a Nuggets team that was trying to win a championship. And you know what? They ended up still winning a championship and Highland only played in 14 games for the Clippers post deadline. He averaged around 10 points a night. He shot 40% from the field, did shoot 35% from three. And that's one of his strong suits because he's been a positive three-point shooter so far in his career. I would like to see him take another step as a playmaker next year. And he's going to be learning under Russell Westbrook. So that's a positive. Funny enough, the Lakers best young player is Austin Reeves, who is 25 years old, and he's going into year three. So Kuminga is going to be 21 going into year three, and Reeves is 25. It's just a funny note. But yeah, Reeves was the Lakers' third best player on a team that made the conference finals last year. He's a really positive playmaker and shooter, shooting 39% from three last season and 52% from the field. He's a really good free throw shooter, and he was maybe too good at getting to the line where it was a little bit fishy out there in LA. But yeah, the Lakers got him back on a steal of a contract, in my opinion. Would you say that DeAndre Aiden has lived up to the hype as a number one? overall pick. I think he's been fine. There's been plenty of worse number one picks in the past. I guess it's only talked about because Luka Doncic was two picks later, but Aiden is one of the NBA's best skilled offensive players at the five. He was really good as a rookie. He got suspended in 2020 and he had a weird 2021 season where his usage was down. But over the last two seasons, he's averaged 17 and a half points, 
10 rebounds a night, two and a half on the offensive end, and shoot 60% from the field. I do expect those offense, I do expect those offensive numbers to go down due to the acquisition of Bradley Beal. So I hope that Phoenix still keeps him in the mix on the offensive end. An absolute no-brainer here for the Minnesota Timberwolves, it's Anthony Edwards. There's a really high chance that Anthony Edwards finishes the 2024 season as a consensus top 15 player in the NBA. His 2023 season was just elite for a 21-year-old. He averaged 24 and a half points, just under six rebounds a night, four and a half assists and was 45% from the field, 36 from three, and 75% from the line. You really just got to watch the first round of the playoffs just to realize how special Anthony Edwards is going to be. He had 18 points in game one. It was really weak. He was actually pretty bad for them. And then he really responded with a 41-point performance, shooting 60% from the field and 60% from three in game two, then dropped 36 points in game three, 34 points in game four, and then 29 points in game five. He was just absurd in round one. And he's going to be absurd next year. An obvious one here for the Dallas Mavericks, it's Luka Doncic, who's still only 24 years old going into his sixth NBA season. Luka is a consensus top 10 player in the NBA. It feels like any season now, he could win his first MVP award. And I just have to see Luka back in the playoffs next year. He just had a 32 point per game season for the Mavericks playing in 66 games. And it was his most efficient season yet of his career looking at true shooting percentage. The Rockets actually just have a ton of good young talent, but I still got to say that it's Jalen and green as their best young guy right now this is a big year for Jalen green a lot of people are pointing at him that he could be an empty stats type of guy he's putting up big numbers but it's not really translating to team success he took 18 shots and came last year and i think that's going to go down with fred van vliet Amen Thompson, Cam Whitmore, all inserting into this lineup. He had a 54% true shooting percentage in year one and year two. And if he can really take a jump to get that up to 58% at the minimum, that would be the step in the right direction for Jalen Green. For the Miami Heat, it's the player that's in all these trade talks. It's Tower Hero. So yeah, the Heat just went to the NBA Finals without Tower Hero. He got hurt in the first couple of games of the playoffs. He was your 2022 sixth man of the year. He had a very efficient 20 point per game season, shooting 44% from the field, 37% from three on eight attempts a night and was the league's best free throw shooter actually at, at 93%. I do wonder what team he's going to be on next year if it's not the Heat. Even with all of the off the court issues, it's still John Morant for the Memphis Grizzlies. He's only 23 years old. He'll be 24 years old when the season starts, and Ja is definitely a top 15 guy in the NBA going into his fifth season. He averaged 27 points back in 2022 and then averaged 26 points a night in 2023. I'm just a little concerned about Ja's injury history as he has had a notable one so far. And I don't think anybody has had a more notable injury history on this list than Zion Williamson, who's coming in here for the Pelicans. Yeah, Zion has played in 114 games in four seasons. That is just absurd. But when he plays, he's so freaking good. He plays like a top 20 player in the NBA when he's on the floor. But that's just a big question with Zion. Can he stay healthy? 24 games in his rookie year, 61 in year two, did not play at all in year three and played 29 games last year. If we don't see at least 50 games from Zion this year, it's going to be another red flag. And we have our second rookie on this list, and it's Victor Wembenyama. Also, not really a shocker here. He didn't perform well in his first career summer league game, but he came right back in game two and had a 27-point performance. He's going to get such easy looks this year with his size and his ability to handle the ball like a point guard, even though he's 7'4". I'm just so excited to watch Wemby in regular season action. And lastly, we have De'Aaron Fox of the Sacramento Kings. Fox is 25, so he can't be on this list too much longer but he is just one of the best point guards in the NBA and has really had a linear progression at the NBA level. He had his best year of his career last season, 25 points, six assists, shot 51% from the field and 32% from three. He really only had one good three-point shooting season of his career leading up to last year and that was in year two and he really looked comfortable behind the arc last year. So yeah, that is gonna be for me. I hope you guys did enjoy the video. Let me know if you agree with all of these in the comments or if there's any you disagree with. Drop like if you enjoy this style of content on the channel and you wanna see more list videos like this and subscribe if you're not already. So yeah, thank you all for watching. I love you guys and I'll catch you on the next one. Peace.